So today we're going to look at part two of our series. We're in a series called Spring. And it's wonderful because spring has sprung. Amen. 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 Um, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for that because it makes for some great sermon illustrations, right? Amen. You, it's nice to talk about flowers blooming when they're actually blooming. Um, but today we're going to look at another interpretation of the word spring, which means, of course, water. It means a source of fresh water, amen? And some springs spring up and other springs flow. But I uh, want to talk to you a little bit about waterways, waterways, waterways. And um, several years ago, I was baptized, more than a few years ago, baptized in the Detroit River, amen? And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And what's interesting about baptism, Helmer, is that when we are baptized, uh, if you're baptized in a body of water, it's different than sprinkling and it's different than uh, pouring, amen? Because when you're baptized in a body of water, you get to actually really feel the symbolism, amen, of being um of dying and rising again. And so I was at Plymouth Church. I was, um, it was uh, Reverend Hood, Nicholas of the Third, and I can't remember who else was there uh, who were involved in the baptizing, but I was a baptizan. I was one of the ones in the white outfits, amen. And so when you get baptized like that in a body of water, what the pastor will do is he will, you know, push your head down and you go back into the water and then you rise up. And the symbolism, of course, is, is, death and burial and resurrection and you go back that's the dying but you go under the water that's the burial and then you come back up and that's the resurrection and so you get to experience uh, in the baptism, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the symbolism, of course, is that you are dying to your old self, amen, and you are rising up to the new self. And the old self stays, come on somebody, buried, amen, stays buried. And um, uh, we've gotten a couple of requests for baptism. If anyone's interested in baptism, uh, please let us know because we have baptized adults and youth. And it looks like we're going to have another youth and adult baptism coming up very soon. If you are interested, please let me know. Uh, let Tracy know. Let Reverend Al know. Let somebody know so that we can get you on the list for baptism. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I'm not exactly sure where it's going to be or how we're going to do it. Amen. But we will. Uh, so we're looking forward to that as the weather gets a little bit warmer. And, uh, but this, the, that, that's the symbolism of it. And, and it was so wonderful. I can't tell you that there were, you know, streaking lights and big booming voices when I got baptized. But I understood, amen, that I was letting some stuff go. And it was going for permanently to, to be buried. And that what was coming up was a new me. What was coming up was a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things. And I don't think that baptism is just a one-time experience of dying to self and rising to a new person. In fact, you can do that anytime you have the awareness, amen, that there are some things in your life, there are some things in your mind, there are some things in your own conduct that need to what? Die. The, the need to die, the need to die, the need to die. And so, and so our, our key scripture is so wonderful here in this regard, and that is our passage of scripture, our key scripture for this particular um, series is uh, Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. It says, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now, this is a scripture that, that, that you ought to read over and over again and remind yourself that God makes a way in the wilderness. And if you feel that you are in a wilderness, then you know that God can make a way. If you feel that you are in a drought or a desert, then you know that God can bring bring rivers, and rivers as a fresh source of water, not a mirage, come on somebody, not just an oasis with one little 
thing of water, but a river in your desert situation. And so this scripture was spoken, as we know, we talked about this last week, this scripture was spoken to the children of Israel who had been taken away to Babylon in captivity. They were not feeling very good about their future. And sometimes we hear some news and we don't feel too good about our future. Can I get an amen? amen? And the prophet Isaiah came to tell them, hold on, there is still hope. Don't give up because there's something good that's coming. And the thing that God is saying here in this verse 18 through the prophet Isaiah is, don't get stuck on the past. Don't get stuck on the failures of the past, but also don't get stuck on the glory of the past. And do not think that just because your life was fabulous when you were 21, it can also be fabulous when you're 91. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, don't we see that in Mrs. Clemens? Mrs. Clemens celebrating 99 years of age. Come on, somebody. Woo, still cute, still looking good, still coming to church. She got here before most of you all. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 She got here before mom and me. Okay. There you go. Uh, so, uh, um, um, it's mom and I. Uh, so anyway, so the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that God's word to us is don't get stuck on the former things. It's not to say that you can't um, remember them. You, you will, of course, remember the things of your past, but don't get stuck there. Don't, don't stay there. Amen. Don't stay there. And, and what is really wonderful about the New Testament is the New Testament has a beautiful corollary to this Old Testament concept of God says, behold, I make all things new. And it's a present active verb. It doesn't say I made all things new. It says I make, meaning that it is an ongoing action in the present tense. How many of you know that our God is in the present tense, right? Our God is. And so this is saying that God is still making a way for us in the wilderness, and he is still doing a new thing. And it springs forth now. When is now? Now is when we recognize that it's springing forth. Amen? And so part of what we want to talk about today is our mindset, is our mindset so that we can have an understanding of what's going on. So in the New Testament corollary is this, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 16 says this, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth, talking about how they understand Jesus Christ. Remember now, Jesus Christ has been resurrected. He's ascended. He's gone. He's not walking around anymore on planet Earth. And so the early church is still kind of lamenting the fact that Jesus is no longer walking with them, talking with them, eating with them, living with them. And so they're, they're, they're looking now. They're looking now for their own hope. And Paul says this. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. What, what are they saying? What they're saying here is that, that we don't just regard people to the, according to the flesh like it really doesn't matter whether you're black or white. It really doesn't matter whether you're well or sick. It doesn't matter whether you're rich and famous or completely unknown. It doesn't matter because we're not going to regard you based on the flesh. We're going to appreciate what's on what? The inside. Amen? We're going to preach what's on the inside. And so just like we don't regard Christ according to the flesh, he came, he walked, he was there. We got a chance to see him, but he's not here anymore. But we still regard him. We regard him because his spirit in the Holy Spirit still walks with us and talks with us. And as the song says, tells us that we are his own. Yes, 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 yes. And so it goes on to say, it goes on to say, in the next verse it says, therefore, right, setting the predicate, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, present tense, he is, present tense, a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. The old has passed away, the new has come. A beautiful corollary to that Isaiah 43 passage. Now God is saying to us in Jesus Christ, behold, I do a new thing. 
And the new thing is Christ, not Christ that walked the earth, not Christ that is ascended, but Christ in you. I mean, the God that created the universe, which is immeasurable, is in you. You got a problem? Christ is in you. You, you got an issue? Christ is in you. Huh. I'm sorry to, to go back, but I said this several months ago, but I just have to say it again. You know, I saw that movie, um, Oppenheimer. I did not know that they took those people, those scientists from around the world, and put them in a city. They built a city to produce the bomb. And the city had a church, it had a school, it had stores, and people literally lived there for, what was it, three or four years. And the only thing they did was figure out how to build a bomb. What would happen if we took the best peace scientists of the world and we put them in a community and we had them live together for four years and all they did was figure out how we can have world peace. I don't know though, maybe that's the house of God, Jamal. Maybe we are the peace scientists living together and coming together every day, eating together, talking together, encouraging one another, amen, that we might contemplate peace for the world, amen. So, 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 so we are new creatures in Christ and that's the message, that's the message. And so, and so, want to go, want to go now to, 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 to this Romans passage and it talks about baptism, but it talks about the fact that there is a new way of living that each of us is invited to and each day can be more new than the next, which means that nobody ever arrives. Nobody ever says, okay, I'm a finished work. No, 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 we're all works in progress and I don't care how holy you are, I don't care how many times you've read the Bible. I don't care how many times you can shout and buck and dance. I don't care how much money you've given and how many churches are listed in your name. Come on, somebody. We are all works in progress. And I heard a preacher once say that if you talk to somebody about their issue, you better do it with tears in your own eyes because of your own rotten sin. Amen. One of the things we decided early on with Life Church Riverside is this is a condemnation free zone. Can we say that together? Condemnation free zone. You don't come here to get condemned. No, no, no. You come here to get built up. You come here to get saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on. That's why you come here. Amen. That's why you come. And so look at this Romans passage. Look at this Romans passage. It's going to talk about baptism. Romans 6 and 3. Look what it says. It says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Mm. Thought provoking. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Woo! See, 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 that, that was your, I heard one amen, come on. That's, that was your shout cue right there. That was your shout cue. It means that you and I are able to walk in newness of life. That means that even though we have some issues, who's got issues? I've got issues. I've got issues, y'all. I got issues. They showed themselves this week, and I had to confess and repent. And so praise the Lord. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor. You know, because the mouth is a dangerous weapon. Come on, somebody. Woo! Yes, yes, yes. Oh, my goodness. So, 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 so pray for me, pray for me. I'm working on it. And so God's working on me. And so it says, though, that there's this thing that raised Christ from the dead, and it is the glory of the Father. See, we come from the church of the resurrection. 
We don't come from the church of the empty tomb. It's not just that there's no body in the tomb. It's that the body was resurrected. And then the body, Jesus Christ, has ascended up to heaven. And Jesus lives making intercession for you and I. So when you pray, Jesus is talking to the Father. When you cry, Jesus is talking to the Father on your behalf. When you've got questions and you just don't know which way to go, Jesus Christ is your Jesus Christ is your defense counsel. Come on, somebody. He is arguing before the judge on your behalf. Amen? That, that, that's, that's, why, that's why people say, well, how would you go from law to, to, to ministry? I'm like, it's the same thing. In the law, I'm before the court. Your Honor, my client, Ms. Doris Walton, has an issue. And I do the same thing at church. Your Honor... Hallelujah. God in heaven, my client, Miss Thors, has an issue. Amen. Hallelujah. Same thing. And guess what? You don't have to go to law school to be that kind of advocate. Hey, hey. That means all of you all can be an advocate. And so, and so this passage of scripture, I think, is so powerful because it helps us understand that there is some newness of life that you and I can walk in. And it means that this newness, this freshness is available to us 24-7, 365. Verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We're talking now about two things. We're talking about the daily resurrections that you and I experience as we get over our own mess. And there's going to be a resurrection at the end of days, and we will all be resurrected. And we will have some kind of body. I don't know what it's going to be like, but my body's going to be able to sing. Woo, yes. And stay on key. Yes, hallelujah. And so look at, so, so, so the similarities between what Jesus Christ experienced help us understand the process of being a Christian in our own lives. We don't want to miss this because this is what enables us to keep going on. Look at verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. See, see, here's the problem with not understanding one's own sin. Then you're not excited when Jesus takes it away. See, there was a popular personality who said that the only sin he ever did was he said something bad to his mama. Well, I feel sorry for him because he's missing out on the grace of God. Because when you know you are a sinner... Hello, when you know you have disappointed God, when you know that you have broken God's commandments, then you can really, look, 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 if you are on death row, if you are headed for the electric chair and somebody comes in and commutes your sentence and says you get to go home to your family, are you not going to be very excited about that thing? But, but, but there are people who are walking around, they're not aware of their own sin. So they're not impressed by God who can forgive their sins. And I hope they get it before it's too late. Before it's too late. So, so we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. This is talking about sin is no longer our master. Sin does not control us or run us. You know, that's the problem with the perfect example I can think of is, is addiction. I've known some people who were addicted, and while they are addicted, the addiction tells them what to do, where to go, how, and when. Right? Right? And, and so, and so, and some people are just addicted to other stuff, y'all. You know, I didn't hear much applause on that one. A lot, some people are addicted to other stuff. You know, you might, crack cocaine might not be your crack. But, but there's some other stuff that might be your crack. Amen? I'm not going to go through the list. You, you, you know yourself. Physician, know thyself. <laughs> Look at verse 7 and 8. For one who has died has been set free from sin. See, if you're dead, sin doesn't have any control over you because you've got no flesh that can be controlled by the sin when you're dead, right? Dead people don't sin. So spiritually, now look at it, look at it spiritually. Now, if we have died with Christ, we also believe that we will also live with him. See, this is why we talk about the resurrection and we talk about the fact that Jesus Christ lived after he was resurrected. He was on planet Earth for 40 days because the 
point is, is that when you're resurrected, you get to live. You get to live. You get to live, y'all. And that's what God wants us to do, wants to live. And I'm telling you, there is a life that a Christian can have that can never compare to the other kinds of lives. You know why? Because Christians are used by God to bring glory to the earth. You, we are used by God to, to forgive people. We are used by God to bless people. We are used by God to give to people. We are used by God to witness to people. We are used by God to be evidence that when God uh, works on us and changes us and transforms us, that what happened to me can happen to this one, this one, this one, and this one. Okay. Verse uh, 9, we know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Wait, now that is exciting because this is the message of the gospel, y'all. This is the message of the gospel. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. That, 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 you know what that means, right? Death has no dominion over you. Because in Christ, you access what? Everlasting life. And you know what? Everlasting is a long time. Everlasting is a long time. You ask those scientists how long the universe has been around. You, you can get a sense of all time. I mean, if I'm just with God a few hundred billion years, I'm cool. I'm good. I'm good with that. I'm, I'm good. Amen? But, but, but eternity is what we're talking about because we're talking about an eternal God. And this is saying that death no longer has dominion over Jesus Christ and no longer has dominion over the person who has submitted and yielded their lives to Jesus Christ. For whom Jesus Christ is two things, amen, Lord and Savior. See, a lot of us want to be rescued. I mean, if I'm drowning, please rescue me. I want to be rescued. But, 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 if, but if you rescue me, that does not mean that you're the Lord over my life. But when God rescues us, when Jesus rescues us, he is now what? The Lord of our lives. He gets to tell us what to do, when, and how. We live for him. Amen? We live for him. Okay, so, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. See, see, part of what we have to do is we have to have another mindset. You have to have a mindset that you are dead to sin. You, you have a mindset that you're dead to sin, that, that sin will no longer have dominion over you. You have to have a mindset uh, uh, of, of um, oh, you know what? I knew that didn't sound right. Hold on. You know sometimes this happens to me, right? You know this sometimes happens to me. Hold on. Okay. Jamal, go to the next slide for me, please. Okay, so I got these slides mixed up. Okay, so we're going to do this slide, verse 10, and then we're going to go backwards to verse 11. Thank you so much. It's nice to have a young person over there. Praise the Lord. So, so verse 10 says, For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So he lives to God, but he's dead to sin. Got it? Living to God, dead to sin. That's the thing. That's the chronology, okay? Now, verse 11 says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'm sorry, I didn't have the correct predicate there for you. But Jesus Christ, dead to sin, alive to God. You and me, dead to sin and alive to God. And we're going to talk about in a minute, how do we get there? How do we get to that place of being dead to sin and alive to God? And I'm so glad you asked. Right? Now, let's look at how the Message Bible says just this verse 11. I, I, I like this. I don't always like notice that the Message Bible, the Passion Translation, these other Bible translations are not actually translations. They are paraphrases, meaning that the author has taken the time and the skill to take the scripture from the original language and then communicate it to us in words that are more appropriate for our age and time, okay? Not a translation. You can't go word for word, okay? But, but in some instances, a beautiful illustration. Look at what it says in verse 11 in the Message Bible. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue. 
Mm. And you hang on every word. Mm, 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 mm. Next slide. You are dead to sin and alive to God, period. That's what Jesus did. I love that. That's what Jesus did. But, but, but go back to that previous, previous verse, beginning of verse 11 there. It's sin speaks a dead language. If I come up to you and I start speaking Chinese to um, Brother Herb back there, who did a great job with the music. Thank you so much, Herb. Beautiful. If I start speaking Chinese to Herb, as far as I know, Herb doesn't speak Chinese. I know he speaks a couple languages, I think French and Spanish, but not Chinese. So if I spoke to him in Chinese, he would just look around. He would not respond. I could say whatever I wanted to in Chinese, and he would not respond because he doesn't understand what I'm saying. And so what the scripture is saying is, think of sin as a dead language. Sin is a language you just don't know. You, you, it's, it's unfamiliar to you. It doesn't speak to you. It doesn't call you. It doesn't command you. It doesn't summon anything in you. Because, because it's a foreign language to you. But you do have a language. And I love the way it's called a mother tongue. Mm, a mother tongue. He said there's a mother tongue, which is the language that comes from God. And I would say it's the language of love. That's your mother tongue. You, you know, when you see a mother that's in love with their child and they just coo 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 and all kinds of little words and loving words they say to their children, to the baby or to their children, they just say little things and hold them. And, and don't get me wrong, daddies do it too. Amen. There's some beautiful fathers in this room. I'm looking at you all right now. I'm, and you were there when the babies were born. You changed the diapers and you fed them with the bottle and you went through all of that. But, but this idea of the mother tongue is such a beautiful image, isn't it, of a mother and a baby. And God is speaking to us in the language of love, that same language that we heard when we were a little baby and mama or grandmama, whoever it was, cradled us in their arms and communicated to us with love. And we learned the first language of love we learn from our loving parents. It might have been a grandparent or a foster parent, but we learn the language of love from people that love us. And that's what God is inviting us to do is to learn the language of love and to allow the language of hate and violence to be a foreign language that we do not speak, that does not command us, that does not summon us, that does not stir anything up in us because it is a strange and foreign language that we do not understand. This is, this, is, this is what this uh, passage is helping us to understand, and I think it's a very wonderful picture. I think it's a very wonderful picture. Uh, um, um, so, 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 so how do we get there? How do we get there? How do we get there? Glad you asked. First of all, this is your assignment to read the verses we just talked about. Go home and read them. You're going to have to read them probably more than once because even this morning as we were reading them, I got more out of it. Amen. Just as we were reading it just now together. So read Romans 6, verses 3 through 11. Read them. And, and it, uh, if you're reading in your Bible, take notes. If you're reading on your tablet, highlight and take notes. You can do that on your tablet, on your phone, whatever. Take notes, okay, so that you will remember those passages. Amen. And then pray. Ask God to help you understand deeply what is in those scriptures. Ask God to speak to your heart and reveal to you what you need to know. Because, look, if you examine yourself, you may yet find areas of your life that need to die. You may yet find ways you communicate, actions that you take. Perhaps it's dead thinking. Some of us have thinking. We conceive of things and we perceive things in a way that really needs to die. Uh, some of us are too prideful and arrogant, amen, and, and we, we, we think we have to let other people know about it. And, and Kel Surprise, uh, what a surprise, you know, nobody really cares, you know what I mean? But we think that everybody wants to know what we have to say and that we have all the answers, come on. And so it might be a way of thinking. Uh, you have to learn something new. Uh, you have to learn something new. If you want to be in a loving relationship with someone, I don't care if it's your brother, your sister, your spouse, your, your fiance, whoever it is, your child, amen, you're going to have to learn how to communicate with them in the language of love right? The language of love. What is that language of love? And that's why we need to talk to God. And then we got to, when we find that dead thing, that dead conduct, that, that, that thing that, ne not dead, it needs to die. That thing that ne it's still alive, it's still alive, but it needs to die. Then what you got to do is, the next step is to let go and learn. 
I know that doesn't sound deep, does it? I know you're waiting. You're like, man, she's going to get deep with us, right? No, no. You got to let go and learn. You got to let go and learn. Uh, 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 um, 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 one of the things that's so interesting um, about getting a new mindset is that um, uh, it's, it's a very powerful experience for us because it teaches us how to live a new way. And if you have a new mindset, you can live a new way. Um, you all know this, you all know this um, story. Um, you know what happened in the 60s when the lunch counters were being integrated. And you know that there were young people, male and female, black and white, and perhaps other ethnic groups as well, and they sat at the lunch counters, and this, this happens to be in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And um, th yeah, this one's in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, but in North Carolina, Greensboro, there were other places where there were these demonstrations. And you know that when they integrated the lunch counters, what happened? What happened? There was violence, right? The people came and pushed them and shoved them and poured ketchup and salt and milk, uh, pulled them off the seats. I mean, the people were very violent. But the students, there were most, mainly students and young people that did this, what did they do? They kept their patience because they had been what? Prepared. They had been trained in the language of love. They had been trained in a way to understand that they don't respond to violence with violence. So when the pictures are shown, who are the violent ones? Not the kids. We don't have pictures of the kids hauling off and punching the people back. We have pictures of the, of the violence coming from the citizens of the area who came to try to stop the students. And what we see, the students submitted. They yielded. They died to the language of hate and violence. And they lived to the language of love. They lived to the language of peace. They lived to the language of reconciliation. They lived to the language of submission to God, and they lived to the language that they had been taught when they had been prepared. And this is what you and I must do. You and I are going to, in the days to come, trust me, there's going to be an invitation in our country to participate in violence. It might be at an election time. It might be because there may be war breaking out in some other country. And you and I must hold steadfast to the language of love. I'm going to have stop, to stop talking about my brother, Mr. Trump. Come on, somebody. Hello? I can't criticize them for hating me if I hate them. How can I do that? I have no, I have no standing to do that, right? I, I've got no integrity in that way, right? And so, so what we have to do is we have to refuse. We have to have a mindset which says that I am now walking in the newness of love, the newness of life, and I have died to my old retaliatory, vindictive, revengeful ways. Amen? kind of quiet in here, kind of, kind of quiet in here, kind of quiet. So, 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 so I think that, I think that that's such a, a beautiful example of how people learn to speak a new language. And guess what? You can all learn to speak a new language. In fact, they say that speaking a new language keeps you from getting dementia. <laughs> you want some longevity? Learn a new language. Hey, you got Spanish, you got French, you got Arabic, and you got love. You got love. Right? You got love. So, 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 so what am I saying? What am I saying? What I'm saying is that you and I have to surrender. We're going to have to yield. We're going to have to let some stuff go. We're going to have to die because I trust you. Trust me. And I trust you. But trust me that, 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 that God's Holy Spirit waterways can carve a new path in your hardened and in my hardened heart. So, 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 yeah, thank you, beautiful. See, he anticipated where I was going, right? And so, and so, this water is powerful. This water is forceful. This water is beautiful. And it is, it is, we are seeing here the, the power of water to erode, but when it erodes, it softens. 
it, it, it does something with the rough edges. It, it smooths some things out. Does anybody have any rough edges that need to be smoothed out? I mean, it can do some things in us. Amen. It can soften us. It, 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 can, it can bring out the hue. It, it kind of can polish us. The water of the Holy Spirit is the, the waterways, the ways of God's love upon us can, can wash away some of our wicked thinking, can wash away some of our cruel hearted, cold heartedness, can wash us in ways that can bring forth some beauty. And if you don't believe it can happen to, the, to you, it look, the Colorado River made this. The Colorado River made this. Hey, if the Colorado River can make the Grand Canyon, cannot God make in us a new way of love? Cannot God make in us a new way of hope? Cannot God make in us a new way of joy? Cannot God make in us a new way of peace? Cannot God make in us a new way of reconciliation? Look, 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 look. The invitation is out there. We have to just... Let go, surrender that old, wicked, crusty, dusty way. It's not serving you anyway. And be born to something new. And understand this, that every day you have an opportunity to grow some more. So, 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 so let's just take a moment. Can I get a little musical accompaniment here? Just take a moment. We're just going to consecrate this moment for just a minute. And just, 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 just close your eyes for a second. Not too long, because it's warm here. You might fall asleep. Um, but, but just think about for a minute, what, what is it that I need to die to? What attitude, what conduct? And then just let God's Holy Spirit water wash over you in these few moments and begin that process of making a new way in your life. God, We relinquish to you the things that we need to let go of. Because we realize we really don't have all the answers. But we recognize that you do. Take what we give you, God, so that it can be buried forever. And then teach us a new way and help us to be students of your language of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if there's anyone who would like to give their life to Christ today, because you've never done it before, and you feel the need to make that connection with Jesus, this is the moment. This is the time. And the doors of the church are open. And the heart of Jesus Christ is always open to you. Amen. So if there's anyone who wants to give their life to Jesus Christ today, don't, don't wait. The love language of Jesus Christ is calling out to you. surrender all. I surrender all. So maybe somebody would like to join our church. Maybe someone would like to come forward and say, yes, I want to be a part of this church. Yes, I want to walk with you guys as we go forward. And if that's you, we welcome you with open arms and be happy to have you. Mm -hmm. All to thee, I surrender. Amen. surrender.
surrender all. Amen.